Um, my name is Chad Post. I'm the director of Open Letter Books, the publishing house here on campus that does all literature and translation, and also runs a website called 3% that covers literature and translation. It's like a blog about the business of books, but also about it has reviews of, of books and translation. But anyways, this is the first Reading the World Conversation series event for the spring. We usually have three events in the fall and three in the spring, and this year is no exception. So the first one is tonight, and then just to let you know about the other two, the next one will take place on Monday, April 12th. 12th at 6.30 in the same space, and will be a discussion that I'll be um, moderating with Horacio Castellanos Moya, a really interesting Latin American author who was a finalist for the Best Translated Book Award last year. And then on April 26th, um, continuing our grand tradition of having an event with the Penwell Voices Festival, we'll have Kim Manzo here, who's a Catalan author, fantastic and hilarious Catalan author, who will be talking with his translator, Marianne Newman, about his book about um, the Catalan literature, about the different things that he does. He's a really interesting guy, so you guys should come out for that as well. And that will also take place in the same exact space. Um, before we get started tonight, I also just want to thank everyone who's responsible for this series to exist, um, which includes the Col College of Arts and Sciences, the New York State Council on the Arts, the National Endowment of the Arts, and the Friends of the University of Rochester Libraries, who were kind enough to put together the reception and food and drink that you have back there. They'll take place after this event. Um, but to put this, this particular event, which is going to feature Helen Anderson, Konstantin Gurevich, who translated, retranslated The Golden Calf by Elfin Petrov, and E.J. Van Lannan, who's our editor for Open Letter Books, I thought I'd tell you a little, bit, a little, bit, a little short story about how this book came about, um, which sort of illustrates like, the, the sort of serendipitous way in which a lot of publishing gets done. Because one of the things that people always ask, no matter where I go, is how we decide to do which books we decide to do. And it's kind of a hard question to answer because Things come about in so many different ways, and sometimes it's just completely random. And this is one of those more random stories. Um, back in 2007, when we first came here, myself, Nate Furl, and E.J. Van Lennon, we started putting together all the plans for Open Letter. And we knew at that time that the first book that we wanted to publish was Nobody's Home by Dubrovka Greshek. It was a, she was someone that we were familiar with. She'd written a number of really interesting novels and a lot of great essays. And this was her new essay collection, and she wanted us to be to publish it, and she was very honored that it would be the first book that Open Letter would put out. So at some point, the manuscript came in, and I was reading it, and, uh, and it's fantastic. But along the way, there's all these quotes from this book called The Golden Calf by Elfin Petrov, which I wasn't really familiar with. Like, I'd heard of Elfin Petrov mentioned. I'd heard of their book, The Twelve Chairs, which was made into a Mel Brooks movie. And there's another book called Little Golden America that's like a satire of, of America on a road trip that they took. Um, but in the middle of this, or towards the end of, of Dubrovka's book, there's this one particular section that I just want to read to you. It says, The culture of the Russian avant-garde, which marked the 20th century, Bulgakov, Babel, Konyak, Olesha, Zoshchenko, Platinov, and I forgive me all my Russian pronunciations, and many, many more, wrote exciting, powerful, dark, and witty literary texts about the fantastic everyday life of communism. The novel The Golden Calf by Elton Petrov is one of the most comic and politically subversive novels written under communism. Smooth operator Ostep Bender, whose sole goal in life was to become a millionaire and move to Rio de Janeiro, is one of the great classic heroes standing shoulder to, so, so, shoulder, to shoulder with Cervantes' Don Quixote or Hasek Spike. The novel appeared in 1927, shortly, after, shortly before the Kharkov Conference and the imposition of socialist realism, and nothing finer has been written in that genre to this day. So obviously with a, with a bit like that from Dubrovka, who I in, have enormous respect for, I was really interested in what this book was. So it happened that the university library had a copy of one of the earlier translations, which they'll, I'm sure they'll talk about the various forms of this book that came out in English. But I read that, that earlier translation and found that, first of all, the translation was awful. It was almost unreadable. Like you couldn't, there was, it was so out of date, everything didn't make sense, and you couldn't, there was no humor in it because nothing was really coming through in the language. But you could see that there's something interesting underneath, and that, that, it was, that it, there was, there's something to this book and to these writers. Around that same point in time, Helen contacted me because she was interested in finding out more about Open Letter and about what we were doing, and also to talk about Russian literature because she said that she and her husband were interested in translating Russian literature and getting more of it published in English. So we had, had lunch, and we were talking, and I said, oh, you know, there's this one book, this is The Golden Calf, that sounds really interesting that, that I'm intrigued by. And she's like, oh, that's my husband's favorite book. You know, we'd love to be involved in that. So time was on, lots of things happened, and as I'm sure they'll elaborate on, this all became like the project that we ended up publishing, um, which is fantastic. And it was, it's cool that it worked out that it was not only the, the great book and that they did a fantastic job translating it, but also that they're here on campus. It's a very, it's just a perfect story, perfect publishing story. Um, 
And the last thing, since no one was going to read from the book, and I think that you should have a little bit, little taste of this before you get in the conversation, because it is a very spectacular and unique book, I thought I'd take the chance to actually read a bit of their translation, which is, which is enormously funny, and I, I'm going to try my best not to laugh during the middle of this. So it begins actually with an epigraph of, look both ways before crossing the street, traffic regulation. You have to be nice to pedestrians. Pedestrians comprise the greater part of humanity. Moreover, it's better part. Pedestrians created the world. They built cities, erected tall buildings, laid out sewers and water lines, paved the streets, and lit them with electricity. They spread civilization throughout the world, invented the printing press and gunpowder, flung bridges across rivers, deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs introduced the safety razor, abolished the slave trade, and established that no less than 114 tasty, nutritious dishes can be made from soybeans. And just when everything was ready, when our native planet had become relatively comfortable, the motorists appeared. It should be noted that the automobile was also invented by pedestrians, but somehow the motorists quickly forgot about this. They started running over the mild-mannered and intelligent pedestrians. The streets, laid out by pedestrians, were taken over by the motorists. The roads became twice as wide, while the sidewalks shrunk to the size of a postage stamp. The frightened pedestrians were pushed up against the walls of the buildings. In a big city, pedestrians live like martyrs. They've been forced into a kind of traffic ghetto. They are only allowed to cross the streets at intersections. That is exactly where the traffic is heaviest, where the threat of, of by which, or, no, I'm sorry, where the thread by which a pedestrian's life hangs is most easily snapped. In our expansive country, the common automobile, intended by the pedestrians to peacefully transport people and things, has assumed the sinister role of a fratricidal weapon. It puts entire cohorts of union members and their loved ones out of commission. And if on occasion a pedestrian manages to dart out from under a silver grill, he is fined by the police for violating the traffic laws. In general, the pedestrian standing is not what it used to be. They who gave the world such outstanding figures as Horace, Boyle, Marriott, Lubeshevsky, Gutenberg, and Anatole France have been forced to jump through ridiculous hoops just to remind others of their existence. Lord, oh Lord, who frankly doesn't exist, how will you, who don't really exist, have let the pedestrian stoop? Here he is walking along a Siberian road from Vladivostok to Moscow, carrying a banner that reads, improve the living condition of the textile workers in one hand, and with an extra pair of Uncle Vanya sandals and a lidless tin kettle dangling from a stick that he slung over his shoulder. This is a Soviet hiker who left Vladivostok as a young man and who, upon reaching the outskirts of Moscow in his old age, will be run over and killed by a heavy truck, and nobody will even manage to get the license plate number. Here's another one, the last of the Mohicans of European foot traffic. He is pushing a barrel around the world. He would have been more than happy to walk just like that, without the barrel, but then nobody would have noticed that he's a long-distance hiker, and the press would ignore him. And so all his life, he's forced to push the damn thing, which, to add insult to injury, has a large yellow advertisement extolling the unparalleled qualities of the motorist's dream engine oil. This is how far the pedestrian has fallen. <laughs> I'll leave off with that and turn it over to EJ, and editor, and Helen Kostya. Picture. Soviet countryside, 1930. It's a small town. Our hero is a staff vendor, a con artist, who picks up three sidekicks. Um, Bender's goal in life is to become a millionaire and escape to Rio de Janeiro, where he'll sip coffee under the trees and wear white slacks. Uh, and as it so happens, um, one of his three uh, sidekicks learns about the existence of someone with a million dollars while he's in jail. Uh, so it's very, very conveniently set up to uh, go after this million dollars. Um, their trip takes them across the, the countryside in an old jalopy that they nicknamed the antelope. And uh, the action is all around how they get the, this money out of the underground